Hey everyone, Luca here, uh, another installment of The Way It Is, and once again, uh, fortunate to have with us Mayor Brian Patterson, uh, which I think we might have to give you an award at the end of the season because you've probably been on the podcast more than anybody, and uh, I know your schedule is uber busy. I follow you on Instagram and you're attending every number of events and activities and, and everything else. I'm, I, I'm not sure how you do it, but I applaud you for doing that. But um, we're here now to talk about uh, the strategic plan for Kingston. It's a time of year. I know a couple of the boards that I sit on, we're doing our strat planning now and revisiting all these things. And obviously, you know, as we just talked briefly before we came on air, Kingston's a busy place right now. There's a lot happening. So, um, you know, I've got the pillars, the five pillars. Maybe I'll just yeah. start with the first one and then you can sort of uh, sort of uh, give us some, some context. Fire away. There's lots yeah. to talk so about. Yeah, so obviously number one, which we've talked about before, mm -hmm. support housing affordability. So yeah. um, such a well, big, big, big question, big topic. What it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that that's the first pillar. Um, you know, I, I, I think back to the election last fall. It was the number one election issue by far. Myself, every other city councillor, we heard more about housing probably than any other issue. So we've all come with a mandate to do as much as we can on the housing file. It's complicated. There's lots of things to do and there's no one solution, but there's a whole bunch of things that we're going to do. And it's, a, I will say, the most ambitious housing plan that I've ever seen in my time on council. Um, it wasn't all that long ago that we aimed to build maybe 2,000 housing units in four years. This, this time, for four years, we're looking at 4,800 units. So wow. that's like not just doubling, it's basically like doubling and then a half on top of that. It's ambitious, but, um, but we know the needs are there. There's yeah. such a need for, uh, for more housing of all different types and all different areas of the city. And that 10% of that would be specifically geared for affordable and supportive housing units. So that's, that's the housing for you know, our vulnerable residents trying to address the homelessness issues that we see. Uh, and again, uh, there's lots of, lots of investments required, lots of strategy, but uh, you know, we're excited. We're excited to get to work on it. Uh, we've actually got a, a housing innovation competition that we're gonna launch. Wow. But basically, we're gonna pitch land and resources and say, we want the most innovative type of housing solution that's affordable, that makes sense, that's high quality, and, uh, and who knows, the kind of housing ideas that could come out of Kingston. So that's obviously gonna mean a partnership in the private sector then, right? Yeah. Which we're looking for developers or builders or contractors that sure. are gonna come forward with those. Sure, things. well, I mean, the city doesn't build housing, we're facilitating. So we're right. looking to the private sector, we're also looking to nonprofits, we're also looking for funding from other levels of government. That's what makes housing complicated is that no one entity can do it all themselves. Right. Uh, but we're gonna take the lead. And so this is all gonna be on city owned lands then, or majority of it? No, there's gonna be a whole, a whole bunch of different strategies. So when you're talking about a land that can be offered or housing that could be offered at a, at a lower lower rent, for example, that's where, yeah, we would look at as a city, could we donate land? Could we find ways to reduce the cost of building that housing so it can be offered at lower rates. But there's also a bunch of other types of housing that need to be built. And that's where we're gonna work directly with developers, find a way to increase, particularly the amount of rental supply, because we know that there's a real squeeze on that. Uh, and so basically, how do, we, how do we build those housing units? How do we make sure uh, people can find affordable uh, rental properties? But also, you know, I'm thinking of those people that want to buy their first home. Yeah. I'm thinking, right, I, I hear from this, like the number of young people that have given up hope of being able to, to, to buy a home. So how do we help create those rungs on the housing ladder? How do we create, was it tiny homes? Are there other options that are available? Uh, you know what, it's a tough problem. Uh, I'm not going to suggest we're going to solve everything here, but we're going to advance and work harder, I think, than any other city in the province on this. Well, and I applaud that and I appreciate it because, you know, I, I see it every day now. We've seen, sure. again, another rate hike last week from the Bank of Canada. And what we've seen, again, is that counterintuitive or the, 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 the unintended consequence of that, of that action because sure. everybody, you know, the market changed considerably and everybody thought, oh, it's going to bottom out. And, and my analogy has been, and I think I've said this before, but it was almost like someone skipping a stone off the bottom of the, of the, off the water. And now it's trajectory, it, the trajectory is upward again. And we're seeing because of the rate increases, though, everybody's dumped into this lower price band. And now first time buyers are struggling because 500000 is the new $300,000. And then there are multiple offers and, and yeah. things selling for 600000 when, you know, yeah. so it's, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a real challenge. Um, all right. Well, pillar number two, 
we've got lead environmental stewardship and climate action. Yep. So, you know, reducing a carbon footprint and yep. everything like that. Yeah. So we're a center of innovation, really, for, for electrification, for example. There's all kinds. There's like a burgeoning electric vehicle industry that's actually sprouting up right in around the Kingston region. And, you know, we're not normally used to seeing the auto sector in this part of the province, but right. uh, there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, obviously, as a city, we're trying to take the lead. We, uh, the last term, we purchased two electric buses. This yep. term, we're going to purchase another 18. Wow. So we're, we're invested in basically a transition to electrification. So there's lots of great opportunities there. And then the other piece is just, you know, being able to do exciting things with green space, right? Natural spaces, like think of like the waterfront here. Uh, we, we've got some exciting projects to come, but it's creating that, you know, an, an urban forest, you know, investing in parks, making sure that even in the urban core, right, that there's a, there's green spaces uh, and really being able to, to show leadership in, in, in those areas. And I think that, um, you know, there's lots of lots of great work to, to be done. Uh, but again, I th I'm really excited about Kingston's leadership, particularly on the electrification piece. Well, and it's great that we're a community that ha we're fortunate to have uh, post-secondary education yeah. institutions like Queen's University. I'm sure you get a lot of consultation and insights sure. from there. St. Lawrence College as well. Or, Lots there's of a lot great of expertise. Ideas. There's a lot of expertise yeah. here, right? Yeah, you got so. a lot of smart people coming up with a lot of great ideas and we can pilot them here. If they work in Kingston, then they can spread to other cities across the province and the country. Um, build an active and connected community. So I guess that segues into what you just talked about, expand parks, the recreation opportunities, beautify city streets and everything like that, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's definitely a few, a few exciting like project pieces, like um, Ports of the Olympic Harbor. Right. It needs a refresh. So we're gonna look at that refresh. The Memorial Center, yeah. right? It needs yeah. a refresh. Uh, Center 70 Arena, right? We've got these, these, these community spaces that they're dated, and the time is right for a fresh community vision. So we're excited to, to launch the, the visioning of what those, those could look like. The other piece that we know um, that we have a real need for is, uh, is aquatics. Right. Uh, I hear this from young families, like when they're trying to book swimming lessons for their kids. And the spots go like in 30 seconds or less. Now, now part of that is just a, a labor force issue. There's, we just need more, more people going into uh, to that industry. They can be lifeguards, they can, they can be swim instructors, but there's also a need for more pool space. And so we're gonna launch an ambitious feasibility study to see what could a new aquatic center look like. You know, are there opportunities for sports tourism? You know, new facilities there. Um, so lots on that piece, but also on the, the connectivity piece. So uh, new transit opportunities, new ways to create, you know, bike and cycling paths, particularly like in the suburban areas. Like it's right. one thing like in the downtown, but how do you create it uh, to be convenient for people, right? To, yep. to maybe bike or to, to walk uh, in different areas of the city. So, I mean, I think that this, that's all kind of the vision behind that. It's about creating a livable community that I think, uh, you know, we've done great work on and want to keep that momentum going. So I'm going to be devil's advocate. Go for because it. Because you mentioned the dreaded words that a lot of Kingstonians have heard over the years, <laughs> feasibility studies yeah. that, that yeah. get shelved and then redone again. And all these monies spent on five feasibility studies for the same thing that never got action. So I guess, and and because I, well, I said I sit on boards and mm -hmm. it's great that everyone's well-intentioned has great ideas, but it's about execution and implementation, right? So first thing is, are, is there going to be actionable items? Secondly, who's paying for this, obviously, right? There's a cost to all of this. You got it. Well, that's why you have to do the feasibility study. Now, we've never done one for this before. So it's not like we've got anything on the shelf to go to. We've just never done it. So... Uh, I say two things about pools. Number one, they're amazing. Number two, they're super expensive. <laughs> so we actually have to do that homework to understand, okay, what would that look like? And then how, how could we make it work? Uh, so there are some steps that are gonna, gonna, gonna have to happen. And I'm very keenly aware that with cost of living pressures, we've got to live within our means. So it can't, the answer can't just be, well, just jack up the tax rate to make it happen. We've got to right. be creative. We've got to look at funding opportunities, uh, partnerships like the, the, with the YMCA, for example, we're looking at some, some creative ideas where we can pool different resources together and, uh, and make our tax dollars go further. So I think that that's a lot of strategic work yet to come, but we've got to start somewhere so right. basically we're gonna we're gonna start it we're gonna do our homework and uh, only when you do your homework do you can you make an educated decision on you know how you're actually gonna build something and, and when you say funding opportunities I mean the world we live in we also know that 
daily, you just have to look at the news, both the federal government and the provincial government like have so many mouths at the trough. Like, I mean, is there that much money to go around and, and, and how does it, I, yeah. Tell, yeah. Well, I mean, you gotta be, you gotta be strategic for sure. You're right. There's only so many dollars to go around. There's lots of other communities that are competing for the same dollars, but, but that's where you look to say, okay, well, uh, why is it that our project would be better than, than somebody else's? And for example, on this particular front, I could imagine a, a partnership with a community organization that uh, is not just aquatics, but also could speak to like a health and wellness hub. You could have all sorts of other features involved that are really speaking to some of the other needs in the community. Right. And so, so, you know, part of my job is to be a salesman for our community, right? right? I'm the advocate. Yeah. So I basically do the homework and try to build a case that I think sets us apart and then we work hard. That's how we built the Wabin Crossing. That's how we've gotten some money for, yeah. for uh, supportive and affordable housing. And so if we need to do that work on, uh, on an aquatic center, we'll do that. But we need, to, we need to understand more. We need to do our homework first. So that's, that's our pledge as a first step. And just as a quick total digression, what's, uh, what's been the feedback about the Wabin Crossing? Have you, have you had any feedback at all? Yeah, it's been, awesome. it's been awesome. It's, okay. been, it's been super positive. I think people love the new connection point. Uh, I think it's exactly what we needed. And the East End is is growing and it's going to continue to grow. So, yeah. I mean, I think that I don't think anyone questions the, the, the need for this this link. If anything, the one thing that, that I have heard uh, questions about is the um, what we're going to have to do on the Montreal Street side. Yeah. Those intersections need to be expanded. It There's can the, create some traffic issues. Yeah. We knew that that was going to happen. Uh, so it's already in the plans. We're doing that homework to, to make sure that we can uh, that we can get those uh, those dollars in and, and get that infrastructure in place. But yeah. the other piece I look at is it's bringing a renewal to a part of the city that I think was ready for that. Absolutely. Renewal. So I yeah. think it's all it's all a good sign. It's creating that momentum. Obviously, lots of work still to be done. Yeah. All right. So now we're on number four: foster a caring and inclusive community. Of course, inclusive inclusiveness and diversity is high yep. on everyone's yep. agenda or radar, I guess. So. Uh, yeah, we're, how is Kingston performing, I guess, as far as inclusivity and diversity? Well, there's definitely, there's definitely a few different pieces in that. So on the one hand, yes, we're seeing our population, we're growing fast, we're becoming far more diverse very quickly. Uh, not a week goes by that I don't meet a, a new family that is not only new to Kingston, but generally new to Canada. Yep. And so I, I think there's exciting opportunities there. At the same time, we want to create that sense of belonging, right? That everybody that is here, that they can call Kingston home. But part of that meets, means meeting other needs in the community. And one of the ones I'm just going to throw out here is on the healthcare front, the family doctor situation. Yeah. It's out of control. And honestly, as a city, this is, healthcare is not a city a responsibility, but we can't look away. We're just seeing how, what the needs are. And so we're stepping in, we're trying to be creative. We're working with other partners. Uh, we've been able to attract a number of family doctors, but there's so much more work to be done there. So, so that's gonna be an area of focus. And, for and so much sure. competition. I mean, you hear the stories out in Nova Scotia or Newfoundland where they're offering certain incentive packages and everything else. And, and uh, you know, it, yeah, I mean, and, and that one group of doctors that's retiring and, yep. and I remember them as a, as a child. I yep. mean, I remember going to that facility and, and you know, you can't fault them for retiring. They've, they've done it for 40 some odd years. For sure. But now there's 8,000 people without a family doctor and stuff. So well, it's, and, it's, and here's the thing. The, the problem with an incentive program is that you've got communities, like you say, competing against one another. So I've already heard of other communities that are upping their incentive fees to try to out, uh, uh, outbid us. And that's just not sustainable. So yeah. we're, we're actually thinking outside the box now. We're thinking about teams of of, of nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors and building teams that actually can see and help more patients right. than just the old approach of just trying to uh, to attract family doctors one by one. You know, I mean, that's where as a city, we'll even look at like finding facilitating space, you know? Yeah. And so uh, we've got some ideas where we've actually got something that we've pitched to the province. Uh, we're hoping to, that uh, that they'll agree to fund it. So again, this is it's a big problem. Uh, but we're uh, we're right in it. Well, and I think it stems too that I don't think there's as many students going into just general practice, practice right? They're going into specializations because I think it's yep. easier for them, and it's 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 a career that they can work around and, and control and everything. Where sure. general practice is a little bit more broad based, right? Sure. So, and I mean, I've, and here we are. My daughter's writing the MCAT uh, the end of the month, and. Uh, 
you know, I hope she gets a high enough score that she can qualify yeah. to, for medical school. And, and I mean, and here we are, we're still using these archaic standardized tests to weed out numbers yeah. when people want to get into the field. And I mean, uh, standard, well, that's just my, that's my soapbox, sorry. <laughs> it's, I a good, it's a good soapbox show. No, we've talked about these like things. A standardized a, test doesn't, doesn't make somebody a good doctor, a bad doctor, a good lawyer, a bad lawyer, or whatever yeah. else they're going to try to do. But yeah. anyway, that's my two cents about that. Well, definitely lots of work still on the healthcare front. Uh, and then on food security. So, you know, especially with food inflation, how do we help those that are having a hard time making ends meet? Uh, you know, those other, other services, you think about the whole mental health and addictions front. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's where we're, we, we know that's a critical need. You, you see it now, you know, if you're, if you're walking through the downtown, you see people that are struggling, you want to be able to provide the services uh, that we can to, to help. And again, these are, these are things the city didn't used to be involved in, but we're trying to step up because we see the need is there. And that's all, I think, the, yeah. the vision of that fourth pillar. And unfortunately, you see, I hate to say it, but you, with the sort of proliferation of it, you also see people's tolerance of it go down, which is yeah. unfortunate side effect of that, because yeah, sure. I think everybody is not, I don't think anybody's not unsympathetic or empathetic yep. to the cause, but yep. I think they're also dealing with their own things too, right? So sure. there's just sure. a little, only there's only so much kindness to go around maybe, I guess is this is the- Well, I think people want to know that something's being done. Yeah, fair enough. Right, and yeah. I think that that's what I hear. So so what am I doing? Okay, well, you know, we're, we're launching a pilot project this, uh, this summer where we're going to have uh, mental health workers that are going to be on the streets helping reaching out pointing people to better services so that they don't have to uh, you know just remain on the street in the downtown we're looking at other strategies just to make sure that it's a downtown is a is a welcoming environment for everybody and it's not just the downtown but other parts of the community as well so how do we how do we be empathetic you said empathy you know empathy but empathy for everyone right yeah. everyone's got their own challenges that we're dealing with but but certainly for those that are facing mental health and addictions you know you can't overcome that stuff on your own you yeah. need help so we want to make sure that help yeah. is there all right we're almost done our walk we've got a good walk here I'll <laughs> get, I'll get. so the last pillar is drive inclusive economic growth mm -hmm. What, what does that mean exactly, I guess? Well, I mean, economic growth, it's always been a passion of mine, obviously. Well, that's your field, right? It's my field, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, a couple of friends, first of all, um, finding more industrial land, right? We have businesses that are lined up at our door. They want to set up shop here in Kingston. They want to provide good quality jobs. The jobs people are going to need to be able to afford housing and be able to afford, you know, to, 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 to build a great life here. Uh, so right now we need to find where that new land can go. And so there's lots of work to be done on that front. Uh, we're also looking on the tourism front about like a convention center, uh, conference center that we could have here in the downtown, which I think would be a, a great new addition, uh, particularly bringing tourist traffic, like on those low months, right? Particularly yeah. in the spring and the fall, which is great. That helps support your small businesses, yeah. uh, here in the core. Uh, and then, you know, the inclusive piece just means that you know, when you bring, when you have economic growth and you bring jobs invested, making sure that everybody benefits from that. Right. Right. So it's not just jobs that are just for, for one segment, but how we make sure that those are opportunities that go to, to, to marginalized groups, to, to everyone that can see the benefit of, of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Well, and, and you just have to drive out into the West End. Uh, I, I, I was doing that just a couple of weeks ago out in the new uh, sort of West End Industrial Park and the buildings that are up there now, it's, it's mind boggling. It's going. I've never seen. I've never seen the city like this. We're growing like gangbusters, and we just want to make sure that, you know, everyone can uh, can benefit. And so when when these businesses are here waiting to come, what's what's the attraction? I mean, I mean, I I mean, as a realtor, I know I've always said Kingston geographically is well positioned. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot going for it. But what what are you hearing from these? from these develop from these i guess businesses or these employers what, what what's what's their draw what's what's the key factors that so i think a couple things number one is we're starting to see some actual clusters forming and so when you've got a number of businesses that are that are in a leading area like sustainable manufacturing uh it attracts other businesses you know we've got umacor coming into the region they're a huge billion dollar operation so other companies want to come in because they want to set up shop and be able to, to feed into that to right. that network I think that the other piece is quite frankly, our quality of life. And you know, you think about post pandemic and where remote work is an option where it didn't used to be. There are so many people that I meet, they move in from Toronto, they still got their yep. job in Toronto, yep. but they wanna, they wanna live here, right? Yeah. So, yep. um, so it's, a, it's a combination where I think some businesses that used to think, okay, well, we need to, to locate closer to the GTA. Now understand that the world has shrunk. And yeah. so now if they can look at Kingston, it's we're more affordable. Uh, we've got a great quality of life. We've got a great local labor force. 
uh, all of those things are super attractive to yeah. some of these businesses. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Brian, thank you so much for the, the walk and the talk, and we timed it perfectly. I left you back. <laughs> I, I left you back, back at the office. office. <laughs> so, that's awesome. That's amazing. Awesome. Well, and you. listen, best of luck with all of it because I know it's a, uh, I know it's a big hill to climb, but uh, I, I'm confident in your abilities to to get there. That's thank for you sure. very much. So. We're looking forward to it. Lots of work ahead, but it's going to be good. Yeah.